Today is the Sunday before Christmas. And in the Orthodox Church, the Church gives us an interesting reading, the genealogy. A bunch of names, basically. You all heard them. Uh, and we see this in Matthew and Luke, where this genealogy in, is given. You know, early on in the church, the, one of the biggest things that, was, that people used to question is whether, you would think it's whether Jesus was God. That wasn't the case. It wasn't that whether he was God. A lot of times what they would question is, is he really human? Was he just appearing in human form, but he's really, uh, he's not truly human? You know, not like how we are human. He's not truly human. And the reason the church fathers say that we put uh, the genealogy there is to remind us that he is fully man, fully God, and he has this history. And if you think about it, if you ever meet somebody in church, let's say you meet a new person, you may ask them what their name is. You may ask them what do they do for work or what brings them to Houston. But before you know it, one thing you'll ask, where are you from? Especially if they're from India, you say, where are you from in India? What's your, maybe your family name? We ask those questions. Why? We want to have an idea of who this person is. Did this person appear out of nowhere? And, and, and we want to know, do I have an idea? And based on that, when they tell us where they're from or what family or what, we have a sense of who this person is, how they might have grow, grown up, what are their values, right? It's a big thing that we ask and that we understand. And so uh, the same thing is given here. And what I want us to kind of meditate on today is the actually the epistle reading that was read from Romans. And he was talking about how we all are also part of this genealogy through faith. In Romans chapter 4 it says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to the, all the seed, not only of those of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of Christ, whom he believed, of him whom he believed, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist. In other words, in Romans, Paul is saying that we all are sons and daughters of Abraham, the one who had uh, true faith, the father of faith. You all know the story uh, in Genesis that we read in chapter 15, where Abraham is down and and and. And he's saying, you know, he hasn't gotten a child yet. And he's telling to God that, I, you know, I haven't gotten a child yet. And then God says, I, I look into the sky, see the stars. And like that, you will have that many children. And he gives him that covenant. And even to this day, we all can be sons of Abraham through faith, through having true faith in Christ. That is the, uh, uh, the genealogy that we participate in. If you remember when Jesus is speaking to Zacchaeus, after Zacchaeus has a change of heart and gives half of his wealth to the poor, gives back everyone that he cheated, what does Jesus tell him? Today, you too are now a son of Abraham. And so it's referring back to this covenant. And Paul is also doing that. And I bring this up because, you know, whenever a child is born and as a child is growing up, one of the things that people like to do is look at that child and say, oh, they look just like this of their mom or this of their dad. They do this just like their parents or just like their uncle or just like their upachan or just like their aunt. They look at a child and say, these are the qualities. They want to see where everything came from. You know, sometimes I think we, when we talk about genetics, we think of physical features, height, or, or complexion, or, in, or, or even maybe things like intelligence, things like that, or certain qualities. But there's a lot more we inherit from our parents and grandparents than that. As a matter of fact, in our uh, marriage counseling that I do, the premarital counseling, one of the things I say is, before you know where you're going into this life of marriage with someone else, you have to know who you are and where you've been. In other words, you have to know, what was your house like? What were your parents like? What was their marriage like? 
Because you're coming into a household with someone else who has a whole different set of things. And one of the things we bring up is like social, you know, like uh, uh, affection. So for example, in some households, it's, you never said I love you. You never gave kiss and hug and all the time. And, but in other households, maybe they do it every day, every, every time they leave, every time they go. You know, and that's very different for people. If you're coming in from a household that they, you, know, you and your parents or your brothers and sisters didn't really kiss and hug all the time, you know, only when you're like going to India or something, to go to a household that every day, every time you see the person, every time you leave the person, kiss, hug, kiss, hug, that's very difficult. Yeah, it's a simple example, but it, it's, it's very hard. Or maybe your family party for Christmas is, you know, uh, quiet and people come together and just maybe sing some songs or have some social time. And another person's family party may be very loud, a lot of people laughing and joking and, you know, very different. And especially I say with faith it can be different, right? Maybe you grew up in a household where it was normal to go to church every week, it was normal to, you saw a household where parents prayed every night. You saw a household maybe where to do the fast, they did the noimba, you know, they did fasting. Then you go to another household where, or you bring in some, someone else from a household that you went to church maybe once or twice a month. Fasting optional, you know, different things like that, right? And so bringing that together is very hard, very difficult. To get on the same page as a new household. And, and, and those, so what I'm saying to that is, we inherit from our parents and grandparents a lot more than just genetics in terms of physical qualities or even just emotional qualities. We inherit a whole way of looking in the world. And especially with faith. I bring this up because one of the things we read from St. Paul is his, his letters to Timothy. He wrote First and Second Timothy. Unlike a lot of his other letters, where he wrote to churches, like Romans, he wrote to the church in Rome, or Corinthians, he wrote to the church in Corinth, or Galatians, he wrote to the church in Galatia, Ephesus for the Ephesians, like that, right? But Timothy is a personal letter. He's writing to someone who is his disciple, his, his spiritual son, he says. He's kind of mentoring him. And Timothy is, becomes the bishop of Ephesus. So he's... He's, uh, he ends up being a prominent leader in the church. But during the letters of Timothy, he's learning from Paul. And Paul is giving him guidance. And one of the things I love is in the second letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, he writes in the beginning, he says, I thank, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. And in verse 5 it says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. He's writing this letter to Timothy and he says, This faith, this genuine faith I see in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. He's talking about the ordination that he gave him. But he's saying that what his grandmother Lois, his mother Eunice, the same genuine faith I see in you. He's saying that. And I really believe that's a message for us. That on this genealogy day, that we look back to our parents, our grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever. And realize that we have a responsibility to the faith that, and who we are in our faith. A lot of it has to do with what they showed and explained in their life. You know, and that's why when, when we all probably were baptized as infants, most of us, we were given godparents. And in Kerala, the tradition is a cultural tradition, not a necessarily orthodox tradition, but a cultural tradition is that your grandparents were often the godparents. So, for example, if you had a son, the father's father was the godfather. Or if you had a daughter, the father's mother was the godmother. That's how it was. But at that time, in India, it's actually very meaningful. And why do I say that? Because oftentimes the grandparents lived with the children. 
with the grandchildren and children. And so while the parents are working and while the parents are doing the things for the house or trying to take care of things, the grandparents would always be this constant reminder of prayer, right? It was very common to see grandparents wake up early to pray or pray reading the Bible or always singing songs. There was always that devotion that was there that the grandchildren picked up on. You know, I had a very interesting conversation when we talked about how, you know, in America, much, not much, but a lot of our generation has kind of fallen away uh, from faith in the church, right? Uh, it may be getting better, we pray, but it definitely has been there in the 80s and 90s, I'm referring especially. And one thing I, I, an uncle told me, which I really never even thought about, was that he said, you know, the biggest loss that this generation had, meaning the people who came in the 70s and 80s and all, especially, the biggest loss that these kids had was they had an absence of grandparents. Meaning we knew our grandparents, but it was we only saw them maybe a few times in our life. Maybe for a summer or something, right? Like it wasn't for most of us. And there are exceptions, but for most of us, we didn't get 10, 15 years of being raised by grandparents. Like how it was for generations before. And so while our parents were working and trying to figure it out for Three generations, really, because they're taking care of their parents, they're taking care of their brothers and sisters, and they're taking care of their children. While they're trying to do that and make their way, and I'm talking about 70s and 80s, right? Now, a little people, we're, as a community, more established. Even if a person comes from India, they're coming into an established place, right? An established community. But at that time, what often goes missing is that spiritual care and attention that grandparents would often provide. So even though my godfather is my, my grandfather, he didn't raise me, right? He didn't raise me. It's not like how in India where they, they raised you. He, I met him a few times, but it was more of an honorary title, right? I'm hoping now with the next generation of grandparents, they actually can be involved because now everybody's here. Now we're in a situation where the grandparents, the parents, and the grandchildren are in the same place. So there can be that. We can get that now. For many of our kids growing up, many of your kids growing up may have some of that, right? Which is good. But I, I bring this up to say the importance of generational care for our children and for us. And we have to know that faith, that what we are doing, and you may not think, you know, and, and this is interesting, and I was thinking about this. I look at some of the active people in our church, right? And I just happen to, and who care. And it's interesting to me that you'll always see either parents who really care, grandparents who do care. Many of them, maybe their grandparents were priests or something like that, or very involved in the church. Even I'm told about me that people tell me my grandfather uh, was very involved in church. My, my mom's dad especially was very involved in the church. Uh, he was CSI, and he was very involved in his church, right? So people even are not surprised. I've only met him a few times, but still that faith, I feel like, gets passed down, you know. And I see that now with a lot of our active people that I, I could see that there was probably something in parents and grandparents that God blessed with children who are, grandchildren who are faithful. And so my encouragement to everybody today, whether you are a child, a, grand, a parent or a grandparent, is to know that whatever you are doing, there is a, not just a blessing or a, a benefit to your life, but it has generational benefit. You know, sometimes I look at uh, people, many of the children who, maybe their grandparents passed away, but I look and I see, and I think, man, whatever their grandparents did, the blessing came on them. And the grandparents never knew it. Right? They passed on. Maybe they know it from a spiritual way. But physically, they're not here to see it. But still, there was a blessing. And so I encourage everybody to think. You may think, it, what I'm doing has no use. My children aren't listening. Or my grandchildren aren't listening. But I really believe that if we do it wholeheartedly, and it may not be when we see it with our physical eye, but I believe that when we do something in a, with a good heart, pure heart, in a genuine faith, that God will preserve our next generations in His faith. 
that, that it will come around. And it may not happen immediately. It may not happen at a young age. It may be later on in life. We don't know how God works and how, how we respond and how people uh, interact with God and when they are ready for it. But I really believe it comes and it will happen and there's a blessing there. So the question we ask as we prepare for Christmas is this. As we prepare for receiving the Lord is... What am I receiving? Am I ready to hand it down to the next generation? Am I showing that? Am I thinking that? that? And I do that now even with my prayer life. When I feel tired and lazy and all, all I have to do is think about the church that I've been entrusted with. And think, if I'm lazy in my prayer life, it affects the whole church. That's how, I, as a priest, I think. If I'm lazy and missing prayer, or doing fast, or kneeling, not only am I affected, this whole community gets affected in a bad, negative way. Each one of us should feel that. That whatever I'm doing, my children, my grandchildren, my family members, my whole community gets affected. That's how powerful our prayer life, our spiritual life is. It's not just you. It is also your family, your loved ones, and even generations to come who you don't even know yet are affected by what we are doing and how we devote ourselves to Christ. May our glory be to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always and forever and ever. Amen.